recording start. All right, so again, this is the adult Sunday school class for Valley Baptist Tabernacle. Uh, we're talking about our faith. So for forgiveness to take place, what is needed? What's, what are all the components that are needed in order for forgiveness to take place? Just think of an example. Humility. All right, that's, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, the value and something you can practice. But that's necessary for, for forgiveness, definitely. But I mean, just practically, what, what, what's in the situation? What has to be present for forgiveness to take place? To believe in God? Sometimes, I would say. Is it possible for an atheist to forgive somebody? It is. They will have a different justification for it. It'll be self-oriented. It, be, it won't be because of what God has done for them. It'll be because, well, I see some benefit for myself, so I'll do that. That's how their, their ethics typically work. Mercy. Right, so what is... So what, is, uh, what does mercy look like? Think of yourself and how God, God forgave you. What happened? Right, not, yeah, not giving you what you deserve. For offending. Okay, so there's an offense, and you're not getting something. Okay. Those are, yeah, those are those are two components. Let's, there's two parties, at least, when it comes to forgiveness, right? And then there has to be some kind of standard, right? And then there's some kind of offense against the standard. So one party offends the other, right? This, this plays out with our sin against God, right? So if we're going to see forgiveness for our sins, there has to be God, there has to be us, there has to be an offense against God, and then God has to forgive that. So there has to be humility, right? There's mercy. That's a component. As we get into Matthew 18, we'll talk about confrontation. You confront somebody about their sin against you. But ultimately, we're talking about humility and forgiveness. And we're going to talk about what, humi or what forgiveness is, what it isn't. And I think a lot of times, if you flip over towards the end of Matthew 18, which this is a giant chapter, a lot going on. But verses 23 through the end of the chapter... Is this parable, and it's really powerful. You know, Peter asks the Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Well, seven times? Like, well, I'm being generous here. You should be proud of me, Jesus. Seven times. The, the, uh, the typical uh, teaching of the day, the rabbis would teach max four. Like, that's the absolute... You're, you're going way above and beyond if you get to four. So Peter's like, seven. Got it. And what does Jesus say? Uh, Jesus said unto him, I say, I'm not doing math. <laughs> I say, not unto thee until seven times. Like, Peter, that's too much. I mean four. You almost expect Jesus to say something like that. It's like seven times, that's a lot. But he flips it on its head, just like he always does. And he says, no, 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 70 times seven. And he doesn't mean, okay, now once they hit 450, now you can just write them off. It's not what he's, it's just unlimited forgiveness. When they offend you, when they sin against you, just, now when you think about that, 
What kind of sins do you think about? Probably someone misspoke, got on your nerves, offended you, you know, or they talked bad about you, but kind of talked to them and made up, you know, something. Is it like that? Or are we talking about like physical abuse? What are we talking about here? That's unlimited forgiveness? What does that mean? I just, you know, you forgive and forget. No? I mean, show me where it says that in the Bible. I won't wait for you. It's not there. It's not there. But what does forgiveness mean? And we read this parable, and it's powerful. And we forget about everything that came before it. There's all this, it's packed full of teaching that comes before it. So how, like, in order to interpret this parable, we got to go back to the beginning of the chapter. That's what we'll do. And we'll read the whole chapter. It's really good stuff. Matthew 18, starting in verse 1. Greatest in the kingdom. Mm. So, a little context. Jesus has started his journey towards Jerusalem. He's heading to Jerusalem to die. He knows that's what he's doing. And so Galilee is way up north, going down the Jordan Valley, and then he's going to go to Jerusalem. It's, it takes a while to get there. While, it's the road trip. While they're on the road trip, this is one of the teachings that he's going to give to his disciples. So the context is he's talking to disciples, talking to believers. Important. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. He's like, you guys got it all wrong. And said, verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Who is he talking to? Disciples. Read that again. Except you be converted. Except you change your mind, disciples. Like, are, are they all believing? There are people following him. Are they really following him? It's a little warning, a little beware, right? Except you be converted, become his little children. You shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Stop and think about this. This is serious. You have to become like a little child. We're talking about dependence here. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. So, how do you get into the kingdom? Become like a little child. What's that a picture of? It's a, like a physical parable that he's teaching here. And then he ends with a, a verbal parable. Pulls a child in and he goes, you have to be dependent, utterly dependent on God, just like a child is utterly dependent on their parents. That's what you need to enter into the kingdom. If you're preoccupied and just thinking over and over and over about who's the greatest in the kingdom, you've completely lost sight of what the kingdom is actually about. About humility. About understanding that you don't deserve that. You're not that great. That's the starting point. You're not that great. You've sinned against God. You need mercy. That's the starting point. In fact, all you can do is just beg for mercy. That's all you can do and hope that you receive it. Verse 6, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones, so now the little ones is a metaphor for a disciple, someone who's entered the kingdom, you offend a disciple, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Man, Jesus is pretty harsh. Don't cause another disciple to sin. That's what he's teaching. Don't cause another disciple to sin. Woe unto the world because of offenses. It must needs be that offenses come. We live in the world, you're going to offend one another. That's just the way it's going to be. Because it's full of sin. Well, it's full of sinners. 
But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two, two hands or feet and be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes be cast into hellfire. Take drastic measures to not offend. Why? How does God treat offenders? Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, remember, disciples. Don't despise them. Don't think that they're worthless, that they're of no value. Don't think about other disciples that way. Because if you're thinking you're the greatest, then they're nothing. See you know how that fits? For I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Where you get the teaching of guardian and angels. For the Son of Man is come to save that which is lost. How think ye? So what do you think about this? If a man have a hundred sheep and one of them gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and go into the mountains and seeketh after that which is gone astray? And if so, be that he find it. Verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety, ninety and nine, which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Remember, he's talking about how do they perish? Well, they're offended by someone, right? They're caused, they're encouraged and caused to sin. And they go on a path that isn't towards God. And then they perish. That's not God's will. You start thinking, oh, I'm the greatest in the kingdom. You'll start to despise other, other Christians. You'll start to think that they're beneath you and that your service to them, they don't deserve it. That's how we're getting from greatest in the kingdom, offending others. How does God treat those that offend him? He seeks after them and seeks reconciliation. That's exactly what he does. He goes after the one that runs away and tries to find them. And when he finds them, there's a party. Read Luke 15. It's awesome. They could hear the dancing. I love that. <laughs> they could hear the dancing and the music. Like every time I read that, I'm like, ah, oh, that is such a shindig. They could hear the dancing. Like go read Luke 15 again. It's awesome. All right. So sin and forgiveness. That's how God treats people who offend him. He goes after them, seeks, seeks reconciliation. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. All right, direct teaching. A brother, another, a fellow disciple, sins against you. What do you do? Go tell him his fault between thee and him alone. He shall hear thee, respond properly. Thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So it's, okay, sinned against me, I confront the person that sinned against me and explain to them what they did wrong. It could be that they're not even aware that they did anything wrong. And if they hear you, they go, oh, I need to change. See how they have to humble themselves, hear your confrontation, humble themselves, and then change. You've gained a brother? Sweet. No one even has to know. It's just between you two. What if you go and confront them? And they're like, whatever. Remember, what kind of sin are you thinking about when Jesus talks about someone sins against you? Like, your husband abuses you. You go to him. You tell him that's not wrong. I don't care. Now what do you do? Not within the church. This is to disciples. I mean, there's, there's enough people that fellowship here in this room. We're going to worship together in like 45 minutes. That statistically, probably that's going on. What are you supposed to do about it? You get some distance and you bring other people in. That's what you do. That's what you do. You get two or three witnesses, and then you confront them again, hoping that they'll change. 
If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. Now the whole congregation comes in. Notice there's a progression from private to public. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen and a publican. That cuts two ways. Like, they're outside the fellowship. Heathens and publicans. They're outside the congregation. But how do we treat heathens and publicans? How did Jesus treat heathens and publicans? He invited them to repent. The conversation switches from this specific example is wrong. You need to change because we're brothers and sisters in Christ and you sinned against me and we need to be reconciled on this. To, do you even know the Lord? You need to repent because judgment is coming. Do you know the Lord? It changes the conversation. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall, or whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that, shall, uh, that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So the context of this is church discipline. Right, where two or three are gathered to go and confront somebody about their sin, hope that they repent, because we're seeking reconciliation, just like God seeks reconciliation, seeks after the, the one sheep that went astray, and going astray, entering into sin. Where two or three are gathered, Jesus is in their midst. Not only that, the decision that the church makes concerning this person whether they can be a part of the fellowship or not. Binding. Binding. Now, this would have had way more effect than it does today, back then, because there weren't just churches on every corner. If we say, hey, you can't worship with us anymore, if that's the church's decision, if that's the discipline that we're going to exercise, hoping that they'll return because they repent, then they just go, yeah, whatever, I'll go to another church. So this is kind of hard to apply. Back then, if they were, it would be, this is when I was thinking about this, this is what it's like. It's like uh, I work at the Alaska Rock Gym. You know, it's a giant indoor rock climbing facility. There are not that many indoor rock climbing facilities in Alaska. Like, this is the main one. If we go, you're not allowed to climb here anymore because of your behavior. That's a big deal. That's what it's like. So it's a, it's a, there are real consequences to not listening when you're confronted, not humbling yourself and changing your mind, repenting of your sin. There are real consequences. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Oh, this is so cool. But we'll just read the parable. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. You're supposed to laugh at that. Like if there was a laugh track, it'd be like, ha 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 ha. Ten thousand talents? That's an unpayable debt. A talent would be... 15 years wages. There's 10,000 of those. <laughs> 150,000 years wages. Can he pay it back? No. You're supposed to laugh. There's Jesus being funny there. See, there's comedy in the Bible. Great. But for as much as he had, uh, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children, and all that he had, and payments to be made. So I was like, this is an unpayable debt. Look, you're just going to go into debt servitude. You're going to go into my estate. You're going to be my, my slave until I get something back. It's not going to be everything that you owe me, but at least I'll get something. And that was the common practice of the day. Very common. The servant, therefore, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will, I will pay thee all. 
You see his heart, though. You see his heart. And that's the important part. Because the king, then the Lord of that servant, was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Don't worry about it. He had compassion on him. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. This is a hundred days wages. All right, so like three months. Not 150,000 years. Three months. Pretty minuscule when you compare the two, right? And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. What? He started choking him. Saying, pay me that thou owest. Whoa. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying the exact same words that he just said to his king. Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. How is he going to pay a debt if he's in prison? <laughs> That's interesting. It's a nice little talk about that. And when his fellow servants saw what, he, or what was done, they were very sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after... Uh, then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredest me, you, because you begged me to do that, and I had compassion on you. Shouldst not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? The answer is, yeah. <laughs> of course. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, he should pay all that was due unto him. It's an unpayable debt. Never going to happen. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you, if ye, from your hearts, where does forgiveness start? From your heart. And the heart in biblical language in, this, in the idea, like when we think of heart, we think of love and emotions, Right? Let's just follow your heart. Not always a great idea. But that's, in our culture, heart usually leans more towards emotions, and we think mind as will, choice, and thinking rational aspect of our, of our being. But in the Bible, your heart is both of those. It's your, it's your will, it's your choices, it's your rational faculty, and your emotions. It's all in the heart. There's no brain in the Bible have that idea. But the heart encompasses all of that. <clears throat> if from your hearts, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother, their trespasses. You have, you're commanded to forgive from the heart. That's where it starts. It's a choice. It's a choice. So first, do not offend other disciples. That's the first thing, right? Who's the greatest in the kingdom? I'm going to put myself above others. No, no, no. Don't do that. Humble yourself as what? As a child. Be completely dependent on God's mercy and forgiveness. That's what a true disciple looks like. That's how you get into the kingdom. You just have to depend on God's mercy. Childlike dependence on God's mercy and forgiveness, that will be welcoming you will inherently be welcoming to other people if that's your attitude. So humble yourself. Repent. Seeking status and thinking you're better than others is completely antithetical to the kingdom of God. And if, that's what you're, if that is your preoccupation, then you've not understood the gospel and you are not in the kingdom. So is your confidence in God's mercy or in yourself, in your status? As a disciple of Christ. Where is it? If it's not in God's mercy, humble yourself. Because if you don't, you won't be welcoming to others because they're going to be competition for who's going to be greatest. You don't need competition. You're supposed to be the greatest. Right? There's only first place. And then there's first loser. Yeah. I'm number one. <laughs> It's all about me. 
It's me time. Humble yourself first. Then take drastic measures to remove offenses. Don't make provision for the flesh. How much do you hate your sin? Your sin could be the reason someone else doesn't come to Christ. And last week, I just hammered on hypocrisy. Like, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. You're making disciples. Don't be a hypocrite. I, there's so many times Jesus talks about hypocrisy. If you refuse to forgive, that is such a giant signal of hypocrisy because you've been forgiven so much. As much as is possible, don't be the one who causes offense. That's the teaching. Now, offenses will come. They will. We're all sinners. We're in this world. They're going to come. But as much as is possible, don't be the one who's offending. As much as you can. That will require humility. So again, you start with humility. It expresses itself in forgiveness. Don't despise other disciples. Why? Because God sought you when you went astray. He sought reconciliation with you. That's what God wants with everybody. And if you think you're better than someone else, then you will despise them. And what that means, again, is you think something has no value. It has no worth. God does not despise them, but rather he seeks to be reconciled with them and to restore fellowship. So he gives the parable of the lost, the one sheep from the 99 lost. The shepherd goes and looks for it, finds it, rejoices, right? What's God's attitude towards that person? And remember, he's telling that parable within this context of an offense. So if the sheep goes astray, that means it's the sheep, the person, the disciple has entered into some kind of sin. What's God's attitude towards that person? One of seeking reconciliation. He seeks after them. He desires to be reconciled. Have the joy, but not let them perish. So here's what it boils down to. If you, recon if you recognize your own tendencies towards sin and your utter need and dependence on God for your salvation and your continued holy life, then this thinking will help you when a fellow disciple sins against you. Why? It'll help you to avoid despising that disp disciple in your heart, and it'll help you to forgive them. Because they're just like you. Their sin might express itself in a different way. And I'm not saying that the, the pain of their sin isn't real, and that we should just ignore it. We're going to get to that in just a second. But if you start to despise another person and think that they're, they're worth nothing, that's not the heart of forgiveness. It's not the, the, the humble heart that trusts God and that realizes that really there's not much different between me and this other person. Not. So. What do you do? The disciple of Jesus offends you. Well, God, Jesus gives us the directions of how to seek reconciliation. So that parable that he told about the sheep going astray, like what does that look like? Notice in the parable, it's just a story to emphasize one point, right? God's seeking. But when it comes to humility and forgiveness, there's two parties, especially when it's between brothers and sisters in Christ. And there's going to be pain, there's sin, and it's, it's going to hurt. So what does that reconciliation actually look like? Well, he gives us the guidelines for it. He says, first, loving personal confrontation. You have to tell them that that was a sin. You have to. I hate this part. <laughs> I don't like to do this. It makes me uncomfortable. I'd rather just overlook it and not address it, and hope it doesn't happen again. Which is ridiculous. My wife is nodding her head. 
It is. That's not what Jesus teaches. But I don't like it. It makes me uncomfortable, so I don't like to do it. So I'll just be like, mm, you know what? I'll just, I'll just forgive him from my heart and overlook it and pretend it didn't happen. And then uh, it'll be okay. I'm, I'm the bigger person here. I'm greater than that person. Yeah, that slips in. Real subtle. And then, here's a parable. There once was a husband and wife. And every once in a while, the husband, there's a brown paper bag in the middle of the room. It'll be really weird. Every once in a while, the husband would just put a little bit of poo in the bag. In the middle of the living room. Let's flip it. Let's say the wife does that. The husband goes, you know, I'm just going to overlook it. Not that big a deal. It's just a little bit. Not that big a deal. Doesn't stink too bad. I'll just overlook it. It'll be fine. Then a week goes by. A little bit more gets added. It's okay. I overlooked it the first time. No big deal. Okay. And then a little bit more. And as time goes on, now the bag's overflowing. They invite their friends over and everybody just ignores it. What is going on here? I'm not, you're going to talk to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring it up. Pretty soon the friends won't come over because it's gross. And then pretty soon it gets to the point where the husband can't take it anymore. He lights the bag on fire and the whole house burns down. If you don't address it sooner rather than later, it's going to completely destroy your relationship. You have to address it. You have to confront. Loving, personal confrontation is necessary. It should be the first step, not the last. And not only that, it's your responsibility to do it. It's the responsibility of the one offended to show the wrongdoer their sin. This is a private matter between the two believers. If the offender responds properly, then excellent. No one needs to know that there is even a problem. We can move on. This is where you get praise in public, reprimand in private. Good rule. All right. This, ah, we don't have time. Leviticus 19, 17, and 18. Uh, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt owe shall in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Loving confrontation. The heart of this is in Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And again, James 5.19 and 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the, the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. But let's say they reject that. Well, now there's confrontation with other witnesses. They should be people who know and love this person from the church and want what is best for them. The witnesses should be men or women of integrity. And... This is, this is what I think. They should be women of, of integrity who are sufficiently distant from the situation that they can remain objective, but close enough to ratify the truth of the situation. So this isn't, I'm going to post this on Facebook, and then you get a bunch of echo chamber type people that go, yeah, you go girl, you tell them. And you do this passive aggressive kind of, oh, I can't believe someone didn't do the dishes and then didn't take, and didn't do this. Oh, Gosh, I wish someone would, we're not going to name names, but we all know who that someone is, right? <laughs> That's not what Jesus taught, right? But there's sin, and they won't listen to loving personal confrontation. You bring others. Like, hey, this is serious. Actually... I don't feel safe around you anymore. And I need these other people to protect me. 
Notice there's a little bit of distance now. See that? That might be, we need to find a social worker to help us through this. We need to find someone else to help us. This is wrong and it needs to change. I don't care. Bring another person. This is wrong and it needs to change. Uh, maybe. Maybe. Progress. If it doesn't change, then you tell the church. If they refuse to acknowledge their sin, now the congregation needs to decide if they want to continue fellowship with someone who refuses to repent. This is clear. It says, when they, Jesus says, when they trespass against you. This is clear sin. It's not like, well, it was just a matter of opinion or preference. or No, no, no. This is a trespass. We need to deal with this. Has to be done. The conversation shifts from restoring fellowship between brothers to this person needs to hear the gospel. Treat him like a publican. Or a heathen. And these practical instructions from Jesus are the way that God seeks reconciliation. See that? He told the parable of the, of, of the sheep, and then he gives this teaching. This is how God seeks after the person that errs. The process for the offender moves from private to public. Try to deal with it between us. You won't listen. You're going to bring some witnesses. You still won't listen. The whole church is going to know. And remember, this is a little bit different in our context because back then, if you brought it before the whole church and then they weren't allowed to fellowship with anybody in that community, it's like they've exiled themselves out of the, the community that would help them the most. And it's going to hurt. It's going to be a, a really harsh consequence in the hope that they'll repent. We see an example of this in 1 Corinthians 5 where you have uh, a man sleeping with his father's wife. Paul's like, what? This is a stepmom, stepson situation. Like, that kind of sin isn't even named among the Gentiles. Are you kidding me? And he goes, you need to put this person out. And in 2 Corinthians, they come back. They repent. They change. It's sin. That's the goal. The process for the offended one moves from near to far. You're bringing more people in to put a buffer between you and the person who offended you. If it's an abuse situation, sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, if it's an abuse situation, you need to get distance. It's not putting yourself back in there. Well, I just need to forgive and overlook all that stuff and, and then get hurt again and again and again and again. That's not what Jesus is teaching. How could you get that if you read the paragraph before the parable? He gives very clear teaching. No, no, no. You put some distance between you and the other person. But the decision to exercise church discipline is the decision to withhold or bestow fellowship. These guidelines from Jesus are followed. Then the decision of the church, the congregation, has the endorsement of God. If the offender doesn't want to reconcile, does not recognize their sin as sin, and doesn't recognize the spiritual authority over them, when you became a member of this church, you said, I'm putting myself under the authority of the church to be disciplined in matters of sin. If you're going to fellowship here. The goal is to sin less. If you just keep on sinning, you're, what are you doing here? Do you really know who Jesus is? What it cost Jesus to pay for that sin that you just revel in? Do you even care? It doesn't make any sense. Church has, you're putting yourself under that spiritual authority. If you don't recognize your sin as sin, you don't recognize spiritual authority, you don't want to reconcile, then don't associate them in close fellowship. Your closest comrades, <laughs> that came out, but anyways, your closest friends, your closest people that you trust in should be the people in these walls. And if they treat you like that, 
then that should not be the closest people that you fellowship with. They have exiled themselves because they refuse to repent and be reconciled. They refuse to humble themselves. I don't need that. I'm okay where I'm at. I'm the greatest. It's all about me. That's a refusal to humble yourself. Distance yourself from that person. Jesus alludes to, just before, then Peter asks the question, how many times? Seven? He goes, no, 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 70 times seven. Jesus alludes to Genesis 4, 23 through 24 with Lamech. So you have Cain. He goes and, yes, oops, thank you. <laughs> it's an unlimited amount of forgiveness. And Jesus alludes to Lamech. Lamech is the picture of murderous retaliation at being injured. This is what it says. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech. He's also the first person to be polygamous. Not, not a great showing. For I have slain a man to my wounding, a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevensfold. Hmm. So he took what was supposed to be a protection for Cain because he murdered his brother. And Cain's like, oh no, people are going to come after me. And so God goes, oh no, no, I'm going to put a mark on you so nobody touches you. And, and if anybody touches Cain, I will avenge him sevenfold. And Lamech goes, yeah. If God was going to avenge Cain sevenfold, he'll have to avenge me seventy and sevenfold. Ha ha ha, I'm so great. What? It's retaliation. That's what he's doing. Murderous retaliation for someone who injured him. I mean, it's just way above what's necessary. It's not justice. Right? That's a picture of our human nature. Unbridled retaliation. That's Lamech. Lamech lives right here. And we have to control Lamech. The disciple of Jesus has a new nature in the kingdom of God, and it should be picturing unbridled forgiveness. That's why Jesus refers to Lamech. In the same way that Lamech has unbridled retaliation, the new creation in Christ ought to have unbridled forgiveness. Well, all right. Forgiveness is not. I'll have to hit these really quick. Is that the first spell? That was the second? My goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Forgive me. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to overlook it. All right. It's not ignoring or forgetting. How can you do that if you're confronting them lovingly? That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not condoning or excusing. No, again, you confront them when they sin against you. That's still part of the process of forgiving. Tolerating or allowing further abuse? No. That's excluded if you just read the paragraph before. It seeks for reconciliation. Or, or actually, humil or forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation or restoration. Forgiveness is... We'll get to this next slide. There are kind of two separate things. Reconciliation requires two people. It requires the other person to humble themselves and actually be reconciled. Maybe that's not possible. Maybe they don't want that. But where should your heart attitude be? It's not uh, returning back to the way things were before. No, this needs to change. It's not allowing the offender to escape consequences. Not if they're put out of the fellowship. There are consequences. Or if, you, if, it, if need be, you bring the police in. Because there are certain things that are illegal and shouldn't happen. Maybe that's the person that you have to bring in. Forgiveness is giving up my right to retaliate. That's what it is. It starts in your heart. That's what Jesus said. So likewise shall my fa heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. You give up your right to retaliate. You're changing your heart attitude towards the offender. Why? Because I'm not that much different than they are. They just sin in a different way. Remember that God has forgiven you. That's the point of the parable. How did you, I just forgave you this giant debt and you're, what? You're not going to forget this, you're not going to forgive this tiny one in relation? In doing that, 
you rediscover their humanity and you offer compassion instead of hatred. That's what forgiveness is, offering compassion instead of hatred. You don't choke them and say, pay me what you owe, and then throw them into prison and make it impossible for them to pay. And you hold bitterness in your heart. And it doesn't matter what they do, you refuse. No. Forgiveness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for all this teaching. Thank you for your love and your grace and your forgiveness towards us. Please help us to, to have this hard attitude. Help us to be the, the anti-Lamech. Just have unbridled forgiveness. That doesn't mean that we don't confront each other when we sin against one another. It doesn't mean that we just let it go, that we condone it, that we, you know, just ignore what happened. No. Or we, we don't exercise our right to retaliation. We just see that you suffered all of the retaliation of human hatred on the cross. And you did that for us. And because of that, we can have new life. Lord, thank you for this truth. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Lord, help us to worship you now. Sing songs to praise your name. Hear, hear more about how the whole world should know about your grace. Through missions. In Jesus' name.